Welcome to Trade Finance Talks, a podcast from Trade Finance Global. During this series, we'll be hearing from global experts, as well as learning about the latest trends, technology and insights in the world of international trade and receivables finance. Episode 14. I'm Dipesh Patel, editor at Trade Finance Global. Machine learning, artificial intelligence, robotics, natural language processing. It seems as though there are a number of disruptive opportunities to digitize trade finance. But I want to get into the nuts and bolts of these buzzwords and assess the real viable applications of these technologies within international trade and finance. The International Data Corporation predicts that worldwide spending on cognitive and AI systems will reach 77.6 billion US dollars in 2022. It's clear that AI has much to offer to the trade and receivables finance space, but we don't know exactly what that means. Today, we're at the Telegraph's Future of Trade and Export Finance Conference, and I have the pleasure of being joined by Michael Bogoslavsky, head of AI at TradeTech. Hi, Michael. Thank you for joining us at Trade Finance Talks. In no more than 30 seconds, tell us your elevator pitch. Who are you and what do you do at Trade Tech? Hi. At Trade Tech, we are creating a market for trade finance assets. Currently, the trade finance receivables, payables, letters of credit, this market remains the exclusively domain of banks, unlike most other financial markets. If you are an investor these days, you can access many assets, you can access commodities, you can access mortgages, you can access private loans, but it's very difficult to access trade finance. What we are doing is create a market network and infrastructure for investors to access these assets. So we often hear news about the 1.5 trillion trade finance gap by the ADB, the ICC. What role does trade tech play within the trade finance distribution initiative that we reported on recently? Trade tech provides the technology behind trade finance distribution initiative. This technology enables banks and non-bank originators to distribute their trade finance exposures to other investors. These days, the banks can originate much more trade finance than they are actually currently originating. There is a demand for it from their corporate clients. However, the regulations and capital rules in many countries and for many banks don't allow them to scale up these exposures. The natural solution would be distributing the exposures to investors, but large institutional investors are not really equipped for decision-making on trade finance assets. They don't have systems for that. They don't have models for that. And that's where we help providing the technology for this origination and distribution. Originate to distribute, very, very interesting model. And we're really looking forward to seeing how the, the trade finance distribution initiative really spans out and how trade tech grows with that. So let's move on to artificial intelligence. And for our audience, what is artificial intelligence? Convince me that it's not just a buzzword. Uh, it is a buzzword for sure. Uh, very trendy one. That's certainly true. AI is useful when one needs to make a decision based on large volumes of data, when you have repetitive transactions which require analysis, and when it's hard for a human or maybe human assisted with some simple tool like a spreadsheet to grasp all the data and the breadth of experience. And trade finance is perfectly suited for that with a large number of small repetitive transactions These transactions happen on a huge graph, the supply chain graph, and grasping the interconnectedness on this graph is not that easy without the proper tools. And that's what AI helps to do. So we use AI to predict the timeliness and the extent of payment on trade finance receivables. And that's something which cannot be done without the AI tools. Thank you. So we'll go into some more details on that very shortly. What were you talking about today? So today we were at the Telegraph's Trade and Export Finance Conference. What were the key take-homes and also what was the vibe from the audience that you were speaking to? Well, I think in the audience there were many more people interested in how AI could help them than people who are actually using AI today. Adoption of AI is at relatively early stages. I would say it is more advanced in some economies. For example, in Asia, in some economies, the AI is used wider. Financial organizations in many cases are not far from using AI and are starting to use it. And the banks 
are actually quite actively investing in this area. There are a lot of fintech companies as well, which are built on AI. The audience was very interested what exactly AI could do for them. And here, I think the main problem many of them would have on the adoption path would be the need for good data. Data is crucial for AI when the data is not available or it's not reliable, it's not timely enough, it's very hard to apply AI. It's also a difference of not just the input, data is the input to the AI. What kind of question you ask the AI is another crucial element of that. If you ask quantitative classification questions, grouping or clustering questions, estimating future quantities, that's something AI does very well. However, something that AI wouldn't be able to do is one of the questions from the audience was whether AI could help to determine whether it's in national interest or not to strike a certain trade agreement. That's not a structured question, and I don't think AI would be ever able to answer that. Thank you. And I think it's very important to understand structured data and and the core methodology, I guess, behind how AI can help improve certain processes within trade and receivables finance. So within our sector, trade and receivables, how is trade tech looking at utilizing AI to help facilitate trading? Can you give me some very specific examples and the core benefits that we can see as a result of this? Uh, We focus our AI on the analysis of credit and payment risks in the supply chain. The investors to whom we help distribute these assets, they don't have the systems available and suitable to analyze these exposures. Uh, These exposures are very granular. Some of the receivables are quite small. They're very short term. So doing traditional human credit analysis for them is just not feasible. Uh, We use data in two layers, data on companies, which allow us to do credit analysis at the company level and also data receivable by receivable arrays of data, which allow us to predict uh, the timeliness and the extent of repayment receivable by receivable. So what our clients get is a scoring, which can give early warning signs that a certain trade relationship will be changing, that a certain receivable falls out of the old pattern, and that the expectations of payments need to be updated. So data on the companies and data on each receivable on a receivable by receivable basis. What are the top challenges with implementing AI within this space? Well, generally in credit analysis, the huge issue is missing or asymmetrically missing data. Generally, when companies are in financial distress, they don't do some things very timely. In particular, they may not file their accounts on time. So just assuming that if data is missing, then probably it wasn't important is extremely dangerous in credit. What we see in credit is that in many cases, the pattern of how the data is missing is much more telling than data per se. For example, when we look at small company accounts, we don't really put that much faith in each single number on these accounts, but it is a fact. We know for a fact if the company has reported a certain number on a given date or not. That's a much more reliable fact than what this number actually is. So our models quite often pick up the presence or absence of a certain field and give it much higher importance than the actual value of the field if it is present. So in credit, generally, this asymmetry of information is crucial and exploiting it correctly is important. The same applies to transactions. If an originator shares with us a data set which just shows only positive experiences they had with clients, we wouldn't be able to calibrate a model there which predicts the likelihood of a negative experience, the model has to learn from the data. So getting the data sets, no data set will be unbiased, but getting data sets with the controlled biases is important for us. Yeah, I think the availability of clean data is potentially something that the industry lacks and very interesting that you guys will give the quality of data or or missing data a particular score based on what type of company it is, whether whether it's a small company and, and where that data point is from. I still think that data quality is a larger issue for AI and trade and receivables in that the systems aren't connected, financiers and banks aren't connected with each other or interoperable, and AI requires huge, huge data sets, many of which we might not be able to access enough data for this to be statistically significant. Do you think, or how ready do you think our industry is to embrace AI right now? I think the readiness is coming We have large digitization initiatives at the financial institutions when they actually are able to access in one place 
their database of historical transactions. We have very important openness initiatives across governments and non-government organizations with an increasing number of countries publishing their corporate data in the common XBRL format. We have the Internet of Things starting to facilitate tracking of goods, which is quite important for assessment of trade finance risks. We have a number of initiatives in the blockchain space which don't have yet the data, but at some point they will be filled with the data in a uniform and accessible format when people with the right access privileges will be able to access this data in a relatively unified way and the rest of data will be improved relative to the current state by the blockchain technology. It's not there yet, but when it will be there, then we'll be ready there to mine the blockchain for data, not mine the blockchain for bitcoins, but to mine it for data, get the data for our models to assess a great risk. Very interesting. And yeah, I guess it's relieving to know that mining for bitcoins. Can AI and machine learning also offer a completely different solution within the trade and receivables finance space, which is the countering of terrorist financing? and also anti-money laundering in a compliance way. Yeah, actually, a lot of the analysis we do is very similar to the analysis that a government and non-government organizations do to uncover money laundering networks. We look at the connections between companies. We're not focusing on the anti-money laundering at the moment per se, but a lot of the analysis is similar. It's just that we're not searching for the transactions where the losses, the reputational financial stem from anti-money laundering breaches, but we focus on breaches due to all kinds of causes. They can be perfectly compliance satisfactory companies, which nevertheless breach their obligations when the risk is not money laundering. In this sense, yeah, these fields are similar. You are looking at the networks, you're looking at networks of companies and the flows between them. Some of the techniques we use are common, but these are mathematical techniques, the techniques of modeling our networks and models. Thank you. So how long do you think it will take before the industry adopts AI as part of a mainstream offering in trade and receivables finance? And what exactly do we need to do to get to that point? I think the industry is getting there. Our clients are already using our AI tools to assess the risk of companies and transactions. Many other companies are doing the same. The originators, the banks and non-banks, are increasingly moving to AI-driven systems, which at least assist the humans making the decisions, if not yet making the decisions themselves. Probably within a year or two, we'll see much more widespread adoption of these tools. There is a number of problems that need to be resolved. I think regulation will be increasingly important in this space. The issue of fairness will be increasingly important especially when the AI is used for actual decision-making, not as just visualization or assistant tool. We are looking actively at these issues. We did the fairness audit analysis of our our models recently, and we are looking to monitor that and take action when we see an unfairness manifested in these recommendations and decisions. Yeah, very interesting. And I guess, you know, think things like machine learning could be dangerous in the sense that they could create some form of bias or polarization of decision-making, which could actually end up prohibiting access to finance for certain organizations? Yes, it can be dangerous, but it can be also quite beneficial. The biases can be created, but also the biases are eliminated by machine learning. The machine learning has the advantage that one has to formulate the definition of fairness very clearly to even try to check the model for fairness. And once one defines it clearly, then one can look for resilient ways to combat that. While for the non-machine learning, for the non-AI process there, it's, people generally disagree on the notion of fairness and that prevents them from doing the remedial action. For Thank you very much, Michael. I'm afraid that's all we have time for today. It's been amazing having you here and actually learning about how AI can implement or can be implemented within the trade and receivables finance sector, but the importance of clean data, understanding bias, and also understanding which parts of the data, whether it's a certain number of a receivable, whether it's a certain number from a small business accounts that's been filed with companies' house, perhaps, and the relevance that that makes towards the decision-making. And, and I guess it's that thinking that really needs to continue to drive AI within the trade and receivable space for a positive change for good. So, Michael, thank you very much for coming and joining us today here at the Telegraph's Trade and Export Finance Conference. Great to have you here. And 
I'll be chasing you up in two years to reevaluate where we're at in the industry. Thank you. Pleasure talking to you. Thanks for listening to Trade Finance Talks. Be sure to subscribe to our podcasts at tradefinanceglobal.com.